Okay. I, I do okay. it. I do it in Dutch. So if it sounds uh, strange, it's it's, it's 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 right. Yeah, <laughs> Dutch is not strange. Oh, <laughs> Dutch is not strange. I will I will try. Uh, beste collega uh, politietrainers uh, en trainers van defensie en andere first responder groepen. Vandaag uh, heb ik een gesprek met uh, uh, Dr. Lewinsky van het Force Science Institute over een van de vele onderzoeken die hij uh, doet naar uh, in dit geval de starter reflex in politiewerk. Maar het Force Science heeft ontzettend veel onderzoek gedaan wat uh, essentieel is voor elke first responder trainer. En uh, ik uh, weet zeker dat jullie er heel veel van zullen leren. So, Bill, I did a I did an introduction in uh, in Dutch for okay. our uh, Dutch colleagues, and uh, well, I think that most most maybe I'm wrong, but uh, internationally you are well known in your Force Science Institute for producing all that great research and for so long. And today we talk about uh, the startle reflex because hey. you brought out a, a study which triggered me and the title was, sorry for my English, but we'll try. The startle response and firearm draw performance in law enforcement officers during a lethal force simulated domestic assault. And well, this is this is great research and uh, very honored to talk with you about it. The implications are, are profound, uh, yes. both for understanding officer response time shot placement and a variety of other factors as well as performance because yeah. we got major differences in performance between those officers who were skilled and those officers who were less skilled and so wow. I, I think it's yeah in mediating the startle response um and ha really responding more effectively and yeah. quicker yeah uh, we, we got a different level of performance so we thought it'd be really important to understand it and and um Before we get into the, the nitty gritty of the research, uh, and maybe I can let you uh, talk about it uh, your, yourself. Eh? Uh, but uh, it reminds me beforehand on the, on the philosophy of Tony Blauer, who for many years ago talked about this start of response. Is, it, is this the same subject matter? Is this the same thing we're talking about? It, it is, but um, we get different effective startle responses and different ineffective startle responses. Uh -huh. For instance, you will see our startle response, officers doing this, mm -hmm. like they're blocking a bullet coming at them. Yeah. Um, not very helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, but if it was a punch, it might be helpful. Yeah. Uh, Blauer talks about hands coming up to protect yeah. the face. Yeah. And we have that. We've got this kind of flinch sort of response that we're getting where the head is down as the trapezius and the rhomboid muscles contract, which then are critical for if we're going to fight or flee, and I tend for the most part to stay away from that with human behavior, but if we're going to fight or flee, we need the rhomboids to contract, to hold the shoulder blades in place so we could grab and have some strength pulling down. It, try to do a chin-up with your shoulder blades up and you can't do it. Yeah. So you need to anchor and yeah. all the shoulder blades are anchored in that startle response yeah. where the shoulders go up and the body begins to contract. We also have some elevation in some officers, but we also have lower. And we have different types of startle response. We've got officers doing this while they're drawing with a, drawing a gun, which is not quite Blauer's thing. So, the, so is, is what you're saying that there are many variations in the start of response? There are many variations and they appear to be connected to the activity the officer is expecting to be involved in. Mm. Uh, that's an unexplored hypothesis at this point. Mm. You know, Blauer's looking at the potential for a physical attack, and if somebody surprises you with a sucker punch, yeah. and you do this, it has some application of deflection, or you know, mm -hmm. kind of stopping the the impact of the strike. Yeah. But in a gunfight, that response is really distracting mm. from what the yeah. officer needs to do. 
Uh, on the other hand, a palm in front of a gun yeah. in a gunfight situation may not be as effective as a palm hitting the shoulder on an assailant who's about to strike you. Mm. Mm. So many questions pop up. Okay, yeah. Oh, and... Yeah, and, and one of the main questions is, can we train this? Yeah. And the answer is, yes, we can train it. Yes, we can condition. I, I'm absolutely convinced we can condition an automatic motor response. And it comes from my half a century of martial arts training. But in the police world, we'd be much better off teaching people to look and see and understand so they don't get caught in ambush situations where they have a startle response. Yeah. You can waste your time getting faster at drawing a gun. And, and I'm all for training a skill at, at a high speed. I, I love high speed performers and accuracy of shooting. Yeah. But if you learn how to perceive, anticipate, control, offset, mm. you gain long periods of time. Yes. Even anticipate when, when something's coming because you're reading the impending assault cues and you know what they mean. You know what target glance means. There's so much we can do in the cognitive yeah. component of this. So it's not just the motor skills we're looking at. It's, no, no, it's no, no. other sorts of elements. Yeah. Two questions pop up. I don't need to answer them directly, but that, that's, then I have uh, then I have spoke them out. That is the first thing, maybe you come to it, is what, what triggers the specific startle response? So is that the behavior of the subject? That's that's one. The second, uh, the second thing is, we always had a saying here that action beats reaction. I I think that's true, but maybe you can learn me more about it. But they also say that being in action beats action, like um, well, anticipating and hmm. right. does that make sense or? Oh, it makes tremendous sense. Uh -huh. You know, in in this in this paper, yeah, which uh, yeah, is available for yeah, free, yeah. Uh, and I'm sure you'll announce the the website. Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's an open access journal. Right. Uh, in, in that paper, we look at changing the formula of response mm. because it is perception. You know, the the general formula is perception, uh, and then we get decision making. And we get some element of motor movement. Yeah. And so we get stimulus and then response. Yeah. And the response is broken up into two. If the person is surprised, it is stimulus. It is startled, reflexive response. It's decision-making and then motor movement. Mm -hmm. It's four components, not three. Because the startle response, uh, which we have measured, yeah, we we went from video assessment in a in a study, a published study on on uh, traffic stops and officers assaulted on traffic stops, to this study in which we had fifteen accelerometers and gyroscopes on the body, and so we measured uh, angularity of action as well as speed of action mm -hmm. uh, on on what was happening with the officers. Yes, uh, which is which is kind of critical for us uh, because understanding where the motion is going and how connected it is to what is happening is really different than just that you had a startle response. Yeah, it yeah, yeah. relates to yeah. your question. Yeah. How effective is the startle response? Can and, you walk us through the study? Yeah, sure. Happy to. Yeah. Uh, we, um, in, in the first study, which I will show you some video of that undergirds the second study, the one that we just published, we put officers in a situation, we had them approach a vehicle three times. First two times we had them engage in communication. They, they thought it was a study on communication. Mm -hmm. And when they came up the third time and they were looking at the driver's face and they were trying to persuade the officer and nobody was looking at the gun hand, which just came up and fired. Yes. And, and so your question is, is it in the actor? Or is it in the uh, actee? Yes. Is, is it in the assailant or is the startle response? 
and it appears in interaction. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The actor has to create in the in the officer uh, passivity, uh, compliance, something, and then an yeah. assault occurs, uh, yeah. or the officer enters a situation and then is attacked in an ambush style. The officer then has to also be unprepared. Yeah. Not ready for what is happening. In in the traffic stop study, we will show you their officers. We, we had 93 officers. Mm -hmm. 92 officers were ambushed and surprised. 93 officers were not ambushed. They suppressed the threat, shot into the passenger compartment, suppressed the threat, crawled inside the passenger compartment, attacking our assailant driver. Mm. They were not surprised, and their action was tremendously effective. In this study, the yes. uh, the firearm study with uh, in which we put officers yep. in a domestic, we had twenty officers. Eighteen exhibited some element of startle response that impaired the time it took them to respond. Yeah. Okay, so we set up a domestic in which the assailant had fled. So the officers were safe to enter. They entered individually and they were going to take a report from a domestic violence uh, victim, survivor. Yeah. Uh, as they were engaged in that, we had the back door behind a bookcase open up and the assailant came in not to be observed. They only heard the door open and they heard a person walking. Mm. And as the assailant came around the corner of the bookcase, he had a gun in what we call bootleg position mm -hmm. behind his thigh. And then he just fired it mm -hmm. multiple times at the officers. So it was a total surprise. Yeah. 18 of them, it was a surprise. And for two, it was not a surprise. They had a bit of a startle reaction, but that startle reaction went right into a gun draw. So the startle reaction was productive and the behavior of those officers was very fast. So the, the startle reaction, if there was any, was really kind of productive in having them come down a draw. Do, do, do you, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, otherwise, the officers were reacting this yeah. way or they're coming up this way. And that took almost three quarters of a second. Yeah. And the officers that were less well-trained and caught by surprise, the startle response was somewhere in the realm of three quarters of a second. And then it went to a productive gun draw. Mm. Mm. And, so, yeah. But did you ask the officers or uh, did you get any information why some were successful and some not? Is there some? In, in our traffic sub study, we did. Uh, and it appears to carry over here because the officers who did a gun draw uh, and without being in a startle response were extremely fluid and very fast. They were among the fastest drawing a gun, both in the experimental as well as in the control condition. Hmm. In our traffic stop study, the three that attacked our driver inside the passenger compartment, two were tactical officers that, that taught um, defense against this type of assault uh, from, a, from within a vehicle. The third one, interestingly enough, was just a regularly trained officer. But she practiced something that we recommend every officer practice. Whether it's communication, whether it's dealing with a difficult subject, whether it's dealing with a potential threat, when you leave that encounter, you practice when-then thinking. Mm -hmm. If this went south on me or soured, what would I do? Mm. And she practiced that all the time on traffic stops. Uh -huh. Doing a passenger side approach, a driver side approach. If, if, if the person was reluctant and I had to use persuasion, what would I use in this circumstance? Yeah. Or if a gun came at me, what would I do? 
And before the gun fired, she was able to suppress that gun and our assault time with that gun from the movement beside the thigh of the driver out the window was just under a third of a second. And she was able to react and suppress it and draw her own gun and shoot the driver. Wow. And she had done nothing but practice when then thinking. And she had programmed a response. So instead of being caught flat foot, she had already built within herself yeah, 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 yeah. The programs that allowed her to react in a more effective way. And if there's one thing missing in police training today, it's this opportunity for every officer to take to engage in when then thinking. And it's not catastrophic. And it's not, I will respond with a gun. It is, if I'm working with a domestic survivor of, of domestic violence or a survivor of sexual assault, and you're reading them and it's unsuccessful, your approach is unsuccessful. You go back and think, what should I have done that would be more effective? And that constant assessment of skills is really critical for ongoing personal and professional development where we own that skill ourselves. But this is, uh, this is uh, it sounds like a cognitive training, Pre cognitive preparing, whatever. Yeah, right. Yeah, right, right. But it's an opportunity yeah. not to engage in a fictional scenario, but to engage in one you just went through. Yeah, 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 yeah. That would allow you to experiment with and think about things that might apply. Yeah. Which you can get an opportunity to apply next time. Yeah. Uh, and then you think when then. And so yeah. it's a constant refinement of skills, which all professionals, whether we're playing a violin, yeah. martial artist, uh, or whatever, I mean, you know, I need that. Do I, do I get that? Is, 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 is this a kind of mental rehearsal also, visualization? or It, it, it is. There's all yeah. those components linked together in when-then thinking, right? Yeah. yeah. And so this also is a great example of when-then yeah. thinking. And the others had practiced the variability of their skill, so they were able to take it to that situation, as opposed to just learning how to handle a particular attack or a situation. And then being caught by surprise when it doesn't meet the conditions in which you were trained. Yeah. As we know with all basic martial artists, yeah. they never take the skill to, or as we did in our academy study, you introduce an element of variability in arrest and control techniques or decision shooting with firearms and the officers caught flat foot because yeah. there's, there's no ecological validity to the training. Yeah. This also looks a little bit like uh, adaptive expertise or adaptive decision making, whatever adaptive. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's rich with yeah. various types of training once you yeah. start to begin to do yeah. that when then thinking. Yeah. So, so what happened in the study? Well, in in the in this study, yeah. Uh, we, we looked at officer response to situations and we were looking at specifically defining what it was that they were doing. Yeah, great. Uh, and uh, we can show you uh, some of the stuff if, if you want to, if you'd share yes. the screen with me, yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll show you some of the traffic stop stuff that we got. And then we can go into the scenarios uh, that were, we did the assessment on yeah. with this. Okay. Great. Okay, so I'll share my screen with you for just a minute. Yes, now we can okay. see it. Yeah, now yeah. you can see. Your, yeah, okay. Yeah. okay, and I will, if if you can't see it when I, I take over the screen, we'll just show you bit by bit here, and I'll, yeah. I'll play it within the context of the screen. Yeah. This is an actual traffic stop, and we're going to look at the speed of an assault on that, and you'll get a startled response right away. State Trooper Ismael Gonzalez pulls over a Jeep for reckless driving. Inside the vehicle, the driver waits with a gun. Fortunately, the trooper is wearing a bulletproof vest. Gonzalez returns fire. No. Yeah, sorry. Gonzalez... 
that of Sultan Gonzalez, two shots being fired and the movement of the gun to the edge of the window, that took a half a second. Mm -hmm. And when Gonzalez was hit, and oh, I can't control the video. Yeah, I can see you. Yeah, I, I know, but I need to play it from the beginning and, and I can't. Uh, and the issue is, Gonzalez, you see his feet are elevated here. I don't know if yeah. you can see that. Yeah. And yeah. you see his shoulders up and hunched. And, and that we routinely got on our traffic stop was people would be hunching their shoulders and we got it on this all the time. Yeah. Uh, it is part of the startle reflexive response the hunching of the shoulders as the trapezius begins to lock in. Mm -hmm. uh, it elevates the shoulders. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so that's Gonzalez's startle reflexive response. Here's another example of a startle response. Um, the officer doesn't see the gun, doesn't see the gun, doesn't see the gun. Now they're beginning yeah. to react to the gun. And that is when I spoke about officers needing to look and see, they will save much more time learning how to read people, yeah. how to understand people. The problem is, and we spoke about this earlier, is executive function is so small that officers who were engaged in communication, we tested their memory after, and they could remember what they were trying to persuade this person about how they needed to cooperate. But they couldn't tell us about where the gun was until it was at them and, mm -hmm. and firing. Yeah. Uh, and But the officers who were focused on the gun and what the person was doing with their hands couldn't tell us what the communication was. Uh-huh. We don't have enough executive function to manage both well enough. And therefore, our sensory awareness and our tactical awareness need to be automatic. Yeah. We need to be as aware as possible at a subconscious level while we're engaged in the tactical issue of communicating. But we will, we will go through this. We'll look at some of the uh, traffic stop studies there's an officer who literally is elevating. Yeah. And, and uh, we went before the, we took this video to the uh, top experts in the world in academia studying startle reflexive response. They've never seen whole body startle response like this. Wow. Uh, that is not only a startle response, but you notice where his gun is? We found yeah. this in, in our current study. Um, that gun is up that high because the officer fought, fought the restraints on his holster. Mm. We lose motor coordination, not because we're under stress. We lose motor coordination because we're trying to do a behavior that's faster than we've ever done it before. Uh -huh. And that's why we have, we have trouble. This officer fought the restraints on his holster until he, he got him loose and then his gun popped up. Mm. And we see that over and over again yeah. when we bring training in an academy to a particular level that guarantees some skill level that is minimal. It is not what the officer will need when they're in a real situation. And so we get this failure that when, when things are driven faster than they are trained. Yeah. So, okay, so we get... We get that sort of thing. There's a startle response as well. Yeah. So recoiling. Yeah. There's another. And, and you see how unproductive that behavior is. Yeah. So this officer, that may be productive uh, as a Tony Blower reflexive response if someone was punching him. Yeah. But in a gunfight situation, that's not productive. No. This is kind of productive. The officer's beginning to go for their gun here. Yeah. That's not productive. The bullet would go right through the hand and into the officer's face above their vest. Yeah. So you, you see that we got a variety of startle responses. This is a productive response. 
the officer is suppressing the gun on the driver and wow. charging inside the cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> the, sure. the cabin. Now, now, that officer was a tactical officer. Mm. Um, this is another tactical officer that is suppressing the gun and then drawing his gun and shooting our driver. Is, is this because of training, do you think? Because of training. You, you see, the, if they're aware and they have the skill, the stimulus stimulates the automatic response of the skill yeah. there's no thought yeah and subsequently it's very fast yeah but the brain is free to then assess what's happening in our officers who are engaged in a startle response it's interesting that they're beginning to recoil uh, and the decision is not productive it is entirely logical yeah and cognitively based which means yeah. it's much slower Yeah. which we did find, we found that uh, the draw time in our study here, the draw yeah. time of officers was much slower in the in the experimental condition than it was in the control condition. Yes. Okay. And this is the study. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So yeah. we'll look at this. Do you see the officer's startle response, particularly with yeah. their their shoulder? Yeah. That elevation of the shoulder, which is what we get. This officer uh, engages in a very quick response right away. Yeah. Okay. And we have the same thing with another officer, uh, except this guy engages in a very contracted, his abdominals contract, he goes down uh, and he draws, but he is beginning to convert his startle response into productive action. Uh, and we're in slow motion, but you can see the skill level of this officer with the draw. Yeah. Also immediately getting off the X. Right. So, Extremely tactical aware, but yeah. still caught by surprise. But his performance was so skill-based that he was able to draw almost as fast as he did in the control condition. So is, is what you were is what you were saying that uh, <laughs> it sounds a little bit stupid, but but a high level skill is very important. Precisely. Yeah. And, and the question then becomes, why do we train police officers to competence instead of proficiency? Mm -hmm. And competence you beat preparing for a test or something. You're preparing for a test. Yeah. The test is in a controlled condition. It's practiced as a closed skill, usually in a closed environment. There's no variability. There's no pre-event awareness and decision-making. There's no ability to offset the uh, the attack by tactical positioning. Yeah. Yeah. We we do not build the context in which these yeah. skills are, are required. Not only is it the proficiency level, but we don't build the context in which the proficiency level is is being performed. Yeah. yeah. And it creates some interesting problems for us. It reminds me a little bit of my solo training in uh, boxing, where I was punching the back like an idiot and punching the, the mitts. But mm -hmm. suddenly I was in a boxing tournament, um, so to speak, and then <laughs> totally different cues, not yes. able to read. Yeah, it's yeah. right, right. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm sorry, but if you hear a car horn uh, blaring, okay. there's. Okay. okay. I, I have, I don't know if you can hear that. No. Okay. Well, I have a permanent click on my jaw. Oh. Uh, I had one week of boxing training, uh, six years of martial arts training, a lot of it with kicking. Uh, uh -huh. I, used, I used to kick trees for years. My yeah. shoes kicking trees down by the river. I go, I have one week of boxing training. I go in and I'm with the Canadian heavyweight champ. <laughs> Central Canada, heavyweight chip. 
Okay, and <laughs> I'm faster than him, and I'm hitting as hard as he is. Uh, and he's a big guy from the prairies of Canada, farmer. And he comes at me with a right hook, and it's slow. Yeah. And my leg is coming up, and I'm prepared to kick him right in the groin. And I realize it's the wrong sport. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I put my yeah. foot down, and he connects with a cross. And oh. I have a permanently dislocated jaw yeah. that cracks every time I want to. Yeah. It reminds me of a slip and capture error. Yeah. 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 Right. Right, right. Which is, you know, it speaks about the need for variability in police training. Yeah. That we, we've got to diversify if we yeah. teach it in a constrained environment. Yeah. The ecological things you speak about are so Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think there, there I think, I'm, I'm not sure because I'm not an expert on this, but the, the information-based approach from, uh, from, from Schmidt and so on, in motor learning, I think, I think it it can be, how do you call it? It fits into ecological approach, the variability and so on. And right. Maybe, maybe the methods differ, but yeah, it's very similar. Schmidt used to teach with us, and now Tim Lee teaches with us. His yeah. co-op teaches with yeah. us. Great. And, and the wisdom they bring about motor learning is just really impressive. I read a paper of Schmidt himself where he. <laughs> where he was so open about uh about his research also it was it was very inspiring mm -hmm. not not like somebody who who tells that he's the greatest but like maybe we can do this better or something like that i'm not sure what it was but what was so great to the real scientist yeah he and tim lee are just amazing human beings yeah Lee taught motor learning for 40 years at McMaster's University in Canada. Yeah. And he now teaches for us in our advanced course. Yeah. He comes in and teaches the motor learning component for us wow. in the advanced course. And we're just blessed to have really such talented people work with us. Yes. I can imagine. Maybe for this uh, Zoom calls ends, what, what can we... Uh... What is the major takeaway for us trainers and teachers? Uh, now we know this about uh, the startle reflex and about how it uh, affects our reaction time and so on. Right. You know, we have tended to focus on in this unit on the motor skills. Yeah. But what is really important is, you know, Vicker's statement that the expert knows what, where, and when, and how things are most likely going to unfold. And that capacity about learning how to read others, uh, whether it's uh, paraverbals, how we are saying what we're saying and what we mean by it versus the words, or kinesics or the actions that people engage in, how to read situations is so critical in understanding what skill is used and how. And in all of the cases in which people operate effectively, they read the situation very well. Yeah. And, and that doesn't mitigate the need to build skills well, but it needs to go hand, yeah. hand in hand with those skills. And, and, and that's, can the, that's yeah. critical. And can, can, the, can the correct, if, if we teach them situational awareness, situational understanding, reading cues, reading the environment, and so on, and so on can we then can they then, how do you call it, make a better startle response, even if they are surprised? Correct. Correct. But I, I know you've talked about the challenges that exist between things that are a challenge versus things that are a threat. Yeah. That, that model for assessing circumstance. And people who are looking for problems that exist and solutions to that problem have an external narrow focus of attention on reading things that provides the most effective cognitive perceptual response that we could have to whatever's going on. So the stuff you're teaching, Eric, <laughs> really, it should undergird all police training. Yeah. It, it really should. I've yeah. listened to your podcast <laughs> and the yeah. wisdom that comes out of your guests and your, yourself really, really does support Thank you. an antidote 
to ambush situations and startle response and officers and better performance across the spectrum. Wow. As well as physiological facilitation. Meaning we tend to think that arousal is bad. Arousal is good. All great performers. Motocross runs the whole race at 180. Supercross, 190 plus. Form 